Hello everyone! When someone becomes interested in making a game, they might first look into terrain generation, since it sounds like fun and every game needs a world to walk around in. A couple hours of research later though, and suddenly making a 2D game instead sounds a lot more appealing. It turns out, terrain generation is deceptively complex due to the amount of intersecting techniques required for a performant, game-ready implementation. So today, we'll be going over the foundations of procedural terrain systems to prepare the beginner graphics programmer for generating entire worlds. Video game terrain can be divided into two tasks, creating the terrain data and rendering the terrain. As usual, this is much easier said than done. Methods for creating the terrain data range from hand sculpting landscapes in ZBrush or Blender to complex erosion simulations, and depending on the scale of your game, lots of optimization techniques are required for real-time rendering of very large, detailed meshes. Worst of all, you can't have one without the other. If you can generate terrain data but can't see it, then the data is useless useless, and if you can render it but don't have any data, then all you have is a big, boring, flat plane. This codependency of complex tasks makes it difficult for learning resources to cover both in depth, leading to lots of half-baked terrain tutorials that don't provide full value to any specific audience. I believe the problem is focusing too much on the game development aspect. There just isn't much educational value provided relative to the work required to accomplish the task of implementing any non trivial terrain system. In my opinion, this makes terrain generation a terrible project for a beginner game developer, but if we were to drop the game ready requirement, suddenly the problem space greatly simplifies, and terrain generation becomes a wonderful project for a beginner graphics programmer. Because terrain intersects with pretty much every area of graphics, with the proper foundational ideas, you could reasonably explore lots of different interesting extensions to further your own learning. After enough work, you'll eventually reach a game-ready implementation, if that's your goal at least. But regardless, it happens to be my goal, so I'll be documenting the process as I go along. Let's start by creating the simplest terrain possible, a flat plane. But first, a word from this video's sponsor. This video has been sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is the best way to learn math, data science, and computer science interactively. With topics covering basic algebra to calculus and beyond, Brilliant's comprehensive range of math courses are built for learners of any level, whether you want to brush up on fundamentals or challenge yourself with advanced concepts. I personally use Brilliant whenever I need a quick refresher on math concepts that I haven't worked with in a while, and I think it's a great starting point for someone looking to improve their math skills for game development as it involves lots of linear algebra. Since much of computer graphics is also just math, as I will demonstrate later in this video, a lot of the lessons can be directly applied to shader authoring to create novel effects such as fractal rendering. Be sure to try out everything Brilliant has to offer with a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual plan when you visit brilliant.org forward slash acerola or click the link in the description. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. For this project, I will be using Godot Compositor FX, but as always, the methods are universally applicable. Graphics engines draw objects in the scene by sending the GPU a draw call. A draw call needs two things, a vertex array containing the mesh data of what we want to draw, and a render pipeline that tells the GPU how to draw it. These two things sound familiar. The simplest plane is composed of just four vertices, the corners of a quadrilateral. We we know that modern GPUs don't draw quads, they draw triangles, so we need to represent these four points as two triangles. The order in which we list the points of the triangles matters because it decides which side of the triangle is the front or back. If we take this triangle and mirror it, you'll see that on the left, the index increases counterclockwise, and on the right, it increases clockwise. So which side is the front? Well, it depends on who you ask. In Godot, the default winding order is clockwise. This means that the triangle on the right is the front face of the polygon. With a clockwise winding order, we define the two triangles of our plane as vertices 0, 1, 3, and 1, 2, 3. Now that we have our mesh data, we need to create a render pipeline that tells the GPU how to draw the mesh. A render pipeline is like a list of settings for the GPU that is applied to every subsequent GPU command, such as how to handle depth and blending. One such setting is the coal mode, which tells the GPU what face of a triangle to ignore. In this case, we want to enable back 
face cooling, so our GPU doesn't render the backside of triangles, which we would never see anyways. This is why the winding order of our triangle list matters. If your triangles ever seem invisible, you might be viewing them from the wrong side. The most important part of the render pipeline is, of course, the shader that the GPU will draw the mesh with. Our initial shader will be as simple as possible. The vertex shader, which executes for every vertex of the mesh, will project itself onto the screen for rasterization, and the fragment shader, which executes for every occupied pixel, will just output the color white. After we compile our shader and create the render pipeline object, we start a draw list, bind the mesh data and render pipeline, as well as the data the shader needs, like the model view projection matrices, which you can learn more about in my previous video, and dispatch the draw call to the GPU. Amazing! Now it's time to make the rest of the terrain! Often confused with each other, video games actually aren't real life, and aside from scans of the earth, any terrain you see rendered on a screen is a cheap imitation of the real deal. Sadly, terrain generation at a very large scale, like water world to the seven continents type stuff, is a currently unsolved, if not unsolvable problem. Accurate tectonic plate simulation isn't really possible, we just don't know enough about the world around us yet. At a smaller scale, more more sophisticated simulation techniques become available to us, like hydraulic erosion, but these techniques require some base terrain data to work with, so how would we create that initial landscape? Since no universal model is available for us to work with, we must do as the artists do, use our eyes to look at the terrain and create a good enough imitation. If we take a look at a few different landscapes, a pattern emerges amongst the horizons of each photo. The height of the distant hills moves slightly over large trends, which ultimately results in a kind of weird, squiggly line. Luckily for us, math is greatly suited for the task of making squiggly lines, something we did a few videos ago when we implemented Perlin Noise, the random squiggly line algorithm. Since the pattern of Perlin Noise resembles those landscape horizons, let's start by defining our terrain height as the noise value at that position in horizontal space. And now, we just need to render this equation. You may have realized by now that video game terrain is less terrain and more a graph of some math function. The vertices of our plane mesh are like plot points of the graph, and four points on a graph isn't exactly an accurate representation of a function. It would seem that we need more than just two triangles, so we can generalize our quad triangulation setup from earlier to any square plane with side length n. There we go, much better. Obviously, optimizing this terrain mesh to balance detail and triangle count is the first major performance roadblock of a more sophisticated terrain rendering system. That's a problem for another time though, so instead, it's time to finally visualize our height function. We have two options here. We could calculate the height of the vertex when we create the vertex data before it's passed to the GPU, or we could calculate the height in the vertex shader on the GPU. For maximum performance, the first option is the obvious choice, as the work is done only once but for maximum usability and rapid development of a more sophisticated height function, the second option is much better. It takes the CPU several seconds to create a mesh of this many triangles. Any change to our height function would require us to wait a while, but if we have the GPU doing all the work, we can make updates to our terrain instantaneously, so I will choose the vertex shader option for now. But Ace Rolla, in your video criticizing game development tutorials, you said calculating Perlin noise in a vertex shader of a mesh is like the absolute worst thing you could possibly do. In the vertex shader, we pass the x and z positions of our vertex into the height function and adjust the vertical position of the vertex. For basic lighting, we'll use the Lambertian diffuse as always. Lastly, we can multiply the light value with a dirt color to make it look more like terrain. Wow. That looks like shit. It seems we're missing some details, but hopefully you can see the vision. Perlin noise, despite not being explicitly composed of any wave functions like sine or cosine, is wave-like in that it oscillates between negative one and one at a constant frequency. This means that just like waves, we can change the frequency of the Perlin noise by multiplying the inside of the function and change the amplitude by multiplying the outside of the function. Aesthetically speaking, these two things have an inverse relationship, a high frequency with a 
high amplitude doesn't look very good, but a low frequency with a high amplitude reveals to us a similar pattern we observed in the landscape photos from earlier, and a low amplitude with high frequency gives us a more detailed, bumpy surface. If we just add these two noise values together, we get the big hills and the bumpy details. Maybe if we add up a whole bunch of different noise values, we can achieve a more interesting terrain model. We want to start off with low frequency, high amplitude noise, and as we add more noise layers, decrease the amplitude while increasing the frequency. Eventually, the amplitude approaches zero, and subsequent noise layers do not add any more details, but the results speak for themselves. We now have a beautifully detailed landscape. This is essentially the same method we used for a water animation in a previous video, but instead of summing up sine waves, we used Perlin noise. If you can remember, this technique is called fractional Brownian motion, because it's fractal. No matter how much we zoom in, the parts resemble the whole, something we can observe in natural terrain as well. Now that we have a base model to work with, it's time to customize it and see the true value of the decisions we made earlier. The easiest customization to add is parameterizing the amplitude and frequency of our noise. The higher the initial amplitude, the greater the height of our terrain. Because we chose to implement our height function in the vertex shader, we can visualize the changes to the terrain instantaneously without having to regenerate the entire mesh. How convenient. We can also customize how the amplitude decays as more noise layers are added. The faster the amplitude reduces, the less detailed the final terrain will be. The initial frequency of the noise determines the horizontal scale of the terrain. Because really small frequency values are often needed, it's generally better to divide to the inside of the function rather than multiply because otherwise you'll be multiplying by like 0.001 and that's just not very intuitive. The rate at which the frequency changes each layer is often called a lacunarity, which is a fancy word for self-similarity. The most common value is 2, meaning the frequency doubles each layer. Smaller values make subsequent layers more similar to each other and the surface becomes less chaotic. This next change is a bit harder to see, more of a just trust me bro kind of adjustment, but right now, all of our noise layers are on the same axis. If we rotate the domain of our noise function each iteration by some angle, we'll get more interesting landscapes as the motion is no longer confined to the same axis. If nothing else, it does look pretty cool messing with the rotation of the noise at runtime. This last parameter is an Ace Rolla special. I wanted to know what it would look like if we rotated the gradient vectors used to calculate the Perlin noise, and it looks pretty neat while adding another layer of customization. All that's left is to add a little bit more color to make the terrain surface more interesting. We can calculate the slope from the normal vector and use that to blend between two different colors, so steep areas of the terrain have one color while flat areas have another. This is obviously not the greatest color solution in the world, as our terrain is almost too detailed, and so the slopes become a little noisy as a result, but it's at least something. With some simple math, we have created a highly customizable terrain generator, which is really fun to play around with but it's obviously missing quite a lot of features. So where would we go from here? As I've said a few times, this approach isn't really game ready, but it is the proper foundation. From here, you could probably make an infinite amount of different improvements. A big missing feature is shadows, and technically the terrain doesn't exist as far as a game would be concerned, so we need a physics mesh in order to interact with and walk around on the terrain. Our two color solution to the surfacing isn't very sophisticated, so textures would be nice. There's also a lot of wasted triangles, so we would love to optimize the terrain mesh. And of course, terrain isn't very interesting without anything on it, so you could add some foliage as well. The point is that the sky is the limit, literally. And if you are interested in trying this out yourself, I am so excited to announce the Ace Rolla Dirt Jam, a month-long event dedicated to helping you get started on your graphics journey through this simple terrain project. Over on Itch, you can find my source code fully annotated for your learning pleasure, as well as a whole list of potential ideas ranked by difficulty so anyone of any skill level can participate, whether you just want to make some cool digital art or get started on a terrain system for your own game. All you you have to do is make an improvement to my terrain generator over the course of the next month however simple it may be. I can already think of one very simple addition that would greatly improve the appearance of our terrain. Make sure to join the event on Itch and join the Discord server to ask questions and share your implementations. I really can't wait to see what you all make. If you'd like to support the channel and help me continue making free graphics programming resources, make sure to check out the Patreon. As always, a huge thank you to all my current patrons. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to go see the Phoenician Scheme five days in a row. Anyways, that's 
that's all from me. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.